There's been a lot of um, turmoil in the world over the last year. You guys are all aware of this. And we look on the newscasts and we see all the turmoil. And, um, you know, we're entering the Christmas of 2023 in, um, in a really difficult way in the world's perspective. But the Bible says that we are not of this world if we know Christ. And because we're not of this world, we have a different perspective. I'm so very glad for each one of you that have come out here today. I know we're focusing on the fourth week of Advent and you just heard the scripture read and the encouraging words. Thank you, Bonnie, for, for saying those encouraging things. Today we're focusing on the theme of God's gift of love. And as believers, that's what we want the focus of this whole Christmas season to be on. And, you know, in Advent, we, the first week, we talk about the hope that Jesus brought into the world. And then we talked about the peace that the Son of God has given the, the hearts of those who have surrendered to him and the joy there is in serving God. But it all means nothing without love. See, because love is at the epicenter of absolutely everything else that God does. Even his justice is centered around the character of his love. And sometimes we get the understanding that God is a different person than he really is. And my prayer this morning is that you'll see the, the love that God has for you. And um, I'd like to, um, Bonnie read a scripture talking about how love for one another is so important because when God's love fills our heart, the outflow of that is to be in the world to other people, because God loves other people. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the message of Christ to a lost world. And this morning we're going to step into... First John, and we're going to, my text this morning is in, in First John chapter 3, one chapter before what uh, the wardens came up here to read. So in chapter 3, starting with verse 1, John writes this, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason that the world does not know us is that it did not know him. See, one cannot emphasize greatly enough the, the majesty and the power of God's love. And John doesn't attempt to describe it, but he asks his readers here to reflect on it, to ponder it, to examine it for what it is. Consider the wonderful love of God that's been poured out on us in the overflowing abundance of Christ Jesus. God had mercy on us while we were still lost in our sins, unable to see our right hand from our left in the darkness. He had mercy on us, and he has called us to come to him if you're broken this morning and you're weary and you're heavy in spirit, God's calling you. And he's calling you to come to his rest. The rest that is in his love. And the Bible talks about humanity that comes 
to submit themselves to him as being part of his royal family. And he wants us to understand how much he really loves us. In the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 5, verses 6 to 8, Paul tells us this. He says, you see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone dare to, sorry, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone possibly might dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And you see, Jesus Christ birthed into the world leading up to his sacrifice. We sang a lot of songs this morning about victory in Christ, celebrating what Jesus has done. So Jesus' birth led up to that sacrifice, and it was the very best gift that could ever be given because by it we've come to have our sins washed away. And we receive his goodness. And we accept his message. And his spirit takes our sin away and casts it as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. And then the presence of God's spirit comes and makes his home inside of us. Consider what the apostle James says about the unchanging character of God. In James chapter 117, it reads this, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly, the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. When Jesus is received as our Savior, God adopts us, and he calls us to become part of his family. You might ask yourself, well, I'm not worthy to be called a son or daughter of God, but, but God calls you nonetheless by his grace because he is a merciful God, and he's a loving God, and he wants you to know him for who he is, not for the preconceived ideas that you've carried with you maybe your whole life, based upon damaging things that have happened. He wants you to know him for who he really is. Now, once we're adopted into the family of God, think about this for a moment. When you're adopted, you become a child of that family. We become the children of our Heavenly Father with all of the rights and privileges of being in the family. And that is what we are. See, the scripture in our text says that is what we are. Children of God. Just at the right time, Jesus came. He knocked upon the door of our hearts and he said, would you open your heart to me and let me come into you and change you and make you a new creation? See, when we come to know Jesus as our Savior, now we become God's child in his royal family and we can boldly approach the Lord's presence at any time of the day or night and he will hear us because he is our loving father where formerly we were outcast because of our sin. God took our sin upon his own shoulders and he cleaned us and he made us new if we believe we become his children. The world and its system outside of this royal family, they don't know the king like we do. They might think they know a lot about him, and they might have various theories about he, what he might be like, because, but because they're spiritually dead at the core of their being, they might 
not even acknowledge his existence. And they certainly don't get him right. I've spoken with many people who speculate with, with me about what God might be like. Not understanding that they're speaking without knowledge. They have studied some things about the spiritual realm, but they've been deceived because there's deceiving spirits out there in this world that want to keep people from coming to know God. And they're opposed to him and his kingdom. And some people have been deceived. They don't understand that what we're saying is truth and life and light. Because, you see, our words, when we speak God's word, they come from the throne of God. They come from the heart of God. The Bible that you hold in your hands or that you're going to be seeing on the screen here, those words are God's words. And they're for us. They're given for our benefit. For anyone who's saved, we became believers when we heard the message of God's gospel spoken to us either by a messenger of the king coming and telling us or by picking up the word of God on our own and reading it for ourselves. By a miracle of grace, the Holy Spirit tugged at our spirits and his love for us was supernaturally revealed. God showed us how distant we were from him, how much we needed a heart change, how our sins had separated us from his presence. And maybe today you're here and your heart is broken and your heart is separated from God and you don't know what to do about it. I'm here to tell you there is good news. There is hope in Jesus. There is peace in his presence There is joy overflowing, but more than all of that, which is all wonderful, there is love, true love that surpasses understanding. True love that is given from the very hand of God to you. You see, I don't think we ever really truly know what love really is until God shows us until he changes us, he fills our hearts and he teaches us how to love others. See, our love, the love of God is not like the love of this world. It's not selfish. It's about making sure other people are built up, that other people are taken care of. And the church, you who have asked Jesus as your savior, to be your savior, we're to be the light of the world, we're to display the love of God. See, The message of the gospel cuts to the core of our hardened hearts and softened us. And instead of a heart of stone, God took our heart of stone out and put a heart of flesh in its place, a soft soft heart before him, a heart of compassion, a heart that sees people around us as God sees them, as God really sees them, not as people imagine that he sees them. We came to an understanding by the Spirit of our need for a Savior. Our hearts were open to the reality of Him and His desire to have a relationship with us by faith. And since we've come to faith in Jesus, we've been forgiven our sins and the Spirit of Christ has made His home in us and our spiritual eyes have been opened. You see, before you know Christ, it's almost like there is, there is caps over your eyes, like scales. And all you can see is on the inside of the scale, and it's dark. God wants to remove those scales from your eyes to open you up to the reality of who he is so that you can live abundantly, so that you can live to glorify him as you were created to in the beginning. The sacrifice of Jesus was applied to our lives washing us, those of us who've accepted him, clean as freshly fallen snow. His presence in our lives has become an absolute game changer. And the world might think we're full of nonsense because the mind that is held by the clutches of of sin is darkened and hostile to God. Romans chapter five verse, or chapter eight verses five to nine says this: "Those who live according to the flesh 
have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of the flesh is hostile, is death. The mind of, governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. You see, as, as fallen people, the Bible tells us that all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. As fallen people, we can strive to be good and we can strive to do holy things. But if we try and please God merely through our own willpower, we're going to be doomed to failure because the nature of rebellion in the sinful heart is too strong for us to overcome by just willing it. If you truly surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you will be amazed by the transformation that God's Holy Spirit will work in you. He will take your hardened heart and replace it. John makes it plain that it's inevitable that the world in its state of unrighteousness is going to look at true believers as though we're strangers or outsiders. And indeed, we are outsiders because we've been taken into a new place. The unsaved world doesn't know what drives us to do what we do and be who we are. They don't understand us, just like they don't understand God. And John tells the people that they ought not to be surprised that now them that become born again in the Spirit do not fit into this world system the same way that they used to. Paul wrote, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. When people's hearts are darkened, they no longer see God for the loving person that he is. A darkened heart views God's righteous standards as oppression and his judgments against evil as unloving. And those with a darkened understanding have bought this lie and it comes straight from God's enemy, Satan. Because he wants to corrupt people's understanding of the true nature of God. But guess what? God's not left this world alone. God has called us as believers in Jesus who have come to know the light of the world to be his ambassadors. As though God himself was speaking through us. So when you're out there with your families and your friends, if you know Jesus and he has saved you from your sins and he has put you right with him, you are a light that shines in the darkness. So let your light shine. This is what, you see, when Jesus came into the world, there was a prophecy given, and we've heard it before in Isaiah chapter 9. Some of us haven't. But many of us have heard this. In Isaiah chapter 9, 700 years before Christ Jesus was born, it predicts his coming into the world. And I want you to hear these words, what the prophecy predicts. It says this, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zeblin and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations. Naphtali and Zeblin or the area right around the Sea of Galilee where Jesus Christ came in and conducted his ministry. But Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. Listen to this. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You know, I've had people... Think, or right out, call me a misled enthusiast for my faith in Christ. Foolish for abandoning the sinful pleasures that are promoted out there in the mainstream. 
in their minds, some people think that we have this false delusional hope for the future without anything to compensate us for our denial of earthly pleasures that we might otherwise enjoy. They couldn't be more wrong. They couldn't be more wrong. The miracle of salvation brought to us through Jesus is evidenced by the supernatural work of the Spirit, transforming us inwardly from a worldly entity into a heavenly entity, from a sinner into a saint. Not because I'm good, but because He is good. Not because I am worthy, but because He is worthy. Not because I have saved myself, but because He came down and became a man. And he rendered a salvation to everyone who would believe and put their trust in him. He came to sacrifice himself so that they wouldn't have to die. And we're part of that. And the Holy Spirit, he's alive. The Spirit of God is life inside of our hearts. And for Christians... Believers, sometimes we can get dulled by this world's influences, can't we? Who's had a hard week? <laughs> Maybe some of you have. Maybe you've been dulled by some of this world's influences. Maybe you've allowed your life to be entangled by sin's deceitfulness again. Apostle Peter says to the believers in 1 Peter 4, 3-5, to Christians... For you have spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, detestable idolatry. They're surprised that you do not join with them in their reckless and wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they'll have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Everyone here regardless of what you think or what you believe, is going to have to give an account to God. And the scripture says it this, he is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance, to turn away from their life of disobedience and to have the king of their hearts as the centerpiece. See, that's what Christmas is all about. See, God didn't have to do things the way he did them. He came down and made himself flesh. God came down to show us what he was like with skin on as a human, yet without sin, the sinless Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. My friends, this is a great, great gift. This is a great gift. 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10. The Apostle Peter says, But you are a choice, chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And John says in our text, chapter two, three, verses two to three, dear friends, now we are the children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purifies themselves even as he is pure. The hope for the future and the hope of Christmas and the manifestation of the love of God is the salvation of God. The salvation of God means that this broken world that we see when we watch the news doesn't have the final say. Your physical ailments and the brokenness of your body doesn't have the final say. Your broken family life where everyone has been betrayed and, and there's shattering going on all around you, that doesn't have the final say. 
Because when you place your trust in Jesus, you are made alive in this spirit. He puts his Holy Spirit in you. The creator of the universe comes and makes his home inside of you. And then you are brought into newness of life. And that life springs forth and flows over into eternity. One day, we're going to stand before God. And one day, this old world is going to fade. And we're going to be, those of us who believe, are going to be given new bodies that are imperishable. New bodies that won't be faced the same kind of testing that we face here in this world. We'll have everlasting life in the presence of God. Now, God can't bring sin into his presence. He's too holy. Those who think they're good enough to stand in the presence of God on their own underestimate God's holiness and overestimate their own righteousness. When you surrender your life to Jesus and you admit, I'm a sinner and I need salvation, salvation is just that, saving from something that is, is not good. You see, there will be eternal separation from God and there will be judgment on sin. But God's not willing that we do that. That's why he came. That's why he came. And he allowed them to stretch out his hands and pound the spikes through his wrists and his feet. That's why he came, born in a manger, in a feed trough that animals fed from, because he wanted every man, woman, and child, regardless of their status, whether they are kings or the poorest of the very poor, to be able to identify with a Savior who is good, a Savior who saves, a Savior who heals, a Savior who delivers from darkness and bondage. So if you're a Christian here today, the good news of Christ is this. You don't have to live bound by the chains of sin any longer. That is no longer your nature, for you not, shall not be a slave to sin any longer. For he has set you free. So live as freemen. Live as freemen in the Lord. Don't think of how you're going to fulfill the desires of that sin nature. I was telling someone this week, there's two dogs inside of us and the one that we feed gets the most attention, grows the biggest and the strongest and the other one diminishes. So if you're a believer, feed, feed the good dog. <laughs> the spiritual life that God's given you and if you don't have that spiritual life in you, today could be the day of salvation. This could be the greatest gift that you've ever received. Today is Christmas Eve. And we celebrate because he lives. Because God cares. And God loves you. I think... <coughs> This, this morning. It's only appropriate that I give you an opportunity to get right with God. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Could someone get me a glass of water, please? It's only appropriate <coughs> that I give you an opportunity to be right with God. I'm just going to ask everyone to bow their head. <coughs> Thank you. You're here this morning on this Christmas Eve of 2023. And you say, God, what Pastor Clint said, I know, I believe it's from you. And it's cut me to the heart. God, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry. I want to live for you and I'm tired of living my life the way I've been living it. So I'm going to lay it before you, Lord. I pray that you would pray this prayer. Jesus, have mercy upon me. I see the sacrifice that you've made for my sins. I see that you were born into this world as the Savior and that's what Christmas is all about. And this Christmas, Lord, I lay down my hostility towards you. And I ask, Lord Jesus, 
that you would come inside of my heart, inside my spirit, and take my sin away. I trust in you, Lord. I believe in you, Lord. I don't know what to do, God, but I know that you will lead me. So would you take my broken heart, Lord? Would you take my heart of stone or my broken heart and mend it and soften it? Forgive me my sin and be my Savior. I believe, Lord. Lord, I'm willing to turn away from the things that have bound me. My living on my own steam and doing things my own way, I, I surrender that to you, Lord, and I turn away from those things that are displeasing to you, Lord, and I ask God that you would help me to live in newness of life. And fill me with your spirit, Jesus. Fill me with your spirit. Cleanse my heart and fill me. This Christmas, God, I come to you. And I thank you. For your word promises this, Lord, that you will come. You will not turn anyone aside who comes. For everyone who believes in the name of the Lord will be saved. Maybe you're a Christian here this morning and if you've prayed that prayer that I just prayed uh, with, with you, if you prayed that prayer, you're here and you weren't a Christian and you are today now, I'd like to talk with you afterwards or maybe you could come or you could talk to someone who you come with who, know, who you know knows Jesus and they could pray some more with you. That's awesome. But for, for the Christians here today, you've been messing around with the things that aren't right. You've allowed the old dog to rise up and become dominant in your life again. And God's like, you need to lay this down. Give this up. Come home. There's the story of the prodigal child who has wandered far away from his home and he's doing things that he shouldn't be doing and he's away from God's purpose for his life, filling his belly with the food of pigs comes to his senses and he says surely I can come home and, and my father would just come and he would accept me even as a servant in his house I'm no longer worthy to be called his child but I, I perhaps I'll go and, and maybe he'll make me a servant and so that person comes and the father is waiting with his arms open wide and he sees his child coming and he runs to that child with his arms open wide my child who was lost you've come home Let's throw the party. Let's throw a party, a feast for my son or daughter who is lost is now home. That's you this morning. Come home. May this Christmas Eve be a homecoming for you. You don't need to be living out there on your own anymore, doing things your own way. You are a child of God. Come to your senses. Abandon the pathway that leads to death and repent if anyone sins. He is faithful and just to forgive of sin and cleanse from unrighteousness, but there has to be a bowing of the heart, a humbling of the heart. Come back to your Father. Lord, if this is you today, um, would you pray with me? Lord, I'm tired of wandering. I'm so sorry for the things that I've allowed to become more important than you in my life. And I just lay them down this Christmas. I want to be right with you, Lord. So would you come and would you forgive me, Lord? Would you cleanse me and make me new? I know that I'm your child, but I need to come close to you again. I've been so far away. I just need to come close to you today. So would you take my prayer, Lord God, and would you draw me close to you? Lord, I honor you today with my life. In Jesus' name, amen.